Shalom, Baruchim Abayim, and welcome to Sheva Im Pani in the Torah to 70 faces of the Torah and also Sulam Yaakov. This week's Torah portion is Parashat Shmini. The reference to Shmini is from the Hebrew word Shimoni, which means eight. And this is a reference to the eighth day of the inauguration of the Mishkan. Now, technically, the Mishkan, according to Jewish history, was erected, consecrated, erected, etc on the first of the month of Nisan. Now, according to the end of Parashat Sav that we just read, Aharon and his sons were required to go into uh, a period of consecration, okay? And therefore, they were to go into a, a realm of isolation for at least a seven-day period. And so at this seven-day period, they were being consecrated for the eighth day, which is the inauguration of the Mishkan. Now, I also like to greet everybody at this current time, a Chag Kashavir Sameach, a happy and kosher Passover. Uh, we are currently in the middle of Passover right now. Uh, at this time of this recording, we are now at Chol Moed, the intermediate uh, period of Pesach. And so we'll be coming up on the last day of Pesach here in a few days. Now, I didn't put out any immediate new teachings for Pesach. I actually have two teachings that are already uploaded, which I believe require a little bit of extra time for people to study, uh, specifically the one that deals with decoding the Haggadah. And I hope everyone had a very joyous and insightful Seder. Okay, we're also in the period of Sfirat Omer, which on the second Seder night, which is the 16th of Nisan, we begin countering the Omer. And so I hope everyone's taking the time out for what we call a Cheshbon HaNefesh, a self-accounting of inventory and continue to analyze and count the Omer as it takes us up to Shavuot, uh, the Kabbalah the Torah, the giving of the Torah, the revelation of Hashem on Sinai, etc. Now, what I would like to say in conjunction with this teaching is that I will be uploading a special teaching for the Pesach, which is something I didn't get to do prior before Pesach began, and this is something on a project that I've been working on for many years, specifically when it comes to uh, studying the history and also the, uh, um, not just the history, the, the, there's the historical unfolding of the events of the Pesach, which are enshrouded in mystery. And what do I mean by that? Is that a lot of people, when they study the, uh, the Yitziat Mitzrayim, the Exodus from Egypt, uh, which is what we do at this time, specifically at the Seder, um, a lot of people kind of just um, look at it from the pages of the Haggadah. Uh, they read about the plagues. Obviously, we learn about it in the reading of the Torah for the Torah portion reading during Pesach. Uh, but a lot of us are not really in tune to those events that took place. And one of the things I touched base on in my previous teaching on decoding the Haggadah was I mentioned in that teaching how Chazal taught and also the Tanakh teaches that the future redemption as mentioned in Sefer Micha is going to parallel the former redemption. In other words, the events that unfolded during the first Yitziat Mitzrayim are going to be on a greater scale in the, what we call the second exodus. And one of the things that I have prepared, and I realize it's probably going to go into so probably a couple parts of this teaching, however, they'll be spread out as I have time to work on them, is looking at the historical events that actually unfolded during the Yitzhak Mitzrayim. In other words, the plagues that took place, the events, the things that were actually going on on the ground. A lot of times when people read the Chumash and they read the events that are happening during the whole exodus of Egypt, uh, they see something supernatural is taking place. Uh, that this is some type of isolated incident that only happened to that location there in Northeast Africa in Egypt. However, one of the things I'm going to present in the teaching is that this event, the event that happened for Yitzhak Mitzrayim was not limited to a local event. Rather, this was a global cataclysmic event that is well documented from the non-Jews around the world in their religion and historical texts and also in their calendars. And Bezar Hashem, with God's help, this is something I'm going to talk about. God willing, I'll have this teaching prepared uh, by the last day of Pesach. So, with that said, we're going to jump right into this week's Torah portion, Parashat Shmini, which once again refers to the eighth day, the inauguration of the Mishkan. 
And one of the subtitles I call this teaching is Dead Religion, Do Not Play With Fire. Now, the primary focus in Parashat Shemini is the inauguration of the Mishkan. However, many of us, we know that the inauguration ceremony was interrupted by the tragic death of Aharon's two oldest sons, Nadab and Avihu. And so we turn over here to the Chumash of Ayichor, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 through 3. And we see, Vayechu v'nei Aharon nadav avichu ish machtato vayitenu v'chein ish vayasimu aleha ketoret vayachrivu lifnei Adonai ish zara asher lo siva otam. And the sons of Aaron, nadav and avihu, took each his fire pan and they put fire in them and placed incense upon it. And they brought up before Hashem an alien a foreign fire that he did not command him to perform. And because of that, the Torah says, A fire came forth from Hashem, meaning it came forth from all the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies, and this fire consumed them, according to Chazal, it entered into their nostrils, and they then died before Hashem. Torah then goes on to say, "Vayomer Moshe el Haron, who asha diber Adonai lemor, bekerovai, ekadesh va'alpenei kol ha'am, akaved vayidom Aharon." Moshe said to Aharon, "Of this did Hashem speak, saying, I will be sanctified through those who draw near." to me. And this is the concept of Korban as I explained back in Parashat Vayikra. A definition of sacrifice is not sacrifice for one, what we call in English, Zevach in Hebrew, which means slaughtering, but Karav is the root of Korban, drawing near. There is a halakhic outline of how one draws near to Hashem, and this is what Moshe is conveying Aharon in relation to the tragic death of his sons who did not follow this protocol. And therefore, God says, I will be honored before the entire people. And Aharon was silent. Now, when studying about the death of Nadav and Avihu, one of the things that stands out is that they were immediately punished for this transgression. Immediately. There was no warning, nothing. Now, when we go back to the event in Parashat Kitasa with the Chehaegel, the sin of the golden calf, we see that when Moshe is having his rendezvous with Har Sinai, God warns him about the whole debacle, the debauchery that's taking place at the foot of the mountain and tells him that he must go down to his people. And so Hashem is angry, without a shadow of a doubt. We do know eventually He intercedes, and it is in that Torah portion that we actually read about the Yu Gimel Midot, the 13 attributes of Hashem. And what's interesting, one of those attributes of Hashem is Erech Apain, which is patience or being slow to anger, as it says in Shemot 34, verse 6. So with that said, if one of Hashem's attributes is to be slow to anger, why is it that he immediately judged Nadav and Avihu by taking our life and bringing this fire that they were not commanded to bring? Well, according to the Torah, the measure of God's judgment is different for the spiritually mature compared to the spiritually immature. And so when God judges the spiritually immature, he is erich apayim. He's patient. He's long-suffering. He allows the spiritually mature to do teshuva in order to rectify the damages that they have created. However, when God employs the attribute of din or judgment, He meets out punishment swiftly. And therefore, there is no long-suffering when it comes to those who are more mature. And so, when we go back to the episode of the Golden Calf, we read Hashem was ready, actually, to punish the Jewish people. However, this punishment would have been met out as soon as Moshe Rabbeinu would have separated himself from the Jewish people. We go back here to Shemot, Exodus chapter 32, verse 9 through 10, and we read, Vayomer Adonai, O Moshe, Raiti Yad Ha'am Hazei, V'chidei Am, Kishei Orefu. And God spoke to Moses, I've seen this nation, and it is very stiff neck. V'ata Hanichali. God tells Moshe, now leave me alone. 
Vihirapi, and then my anger of him will wax hot against them, and I will va'achalim, I will consume them, destroy them. And very similar to what God told Abraham Avinu back in Parsha Lechacha in Genesis 12, I will produce you into a great nation. In other words, you will be the continuation of the covenant with Abraham is what Hashem is telling Moshe Rabbeinu here. So this phrase that I've highlighted in yellow here, and now leave me alone, implies that God would punish the Jewish people as soon as Moshe departed from his presence. However, Moshe sees the opportunity to intercede on behalf of the Jewish people, which provided them a window, an opportunity to do shuva for the transgression. We also learn back in Parashat Shemot that when Moshe was returning to Mitzrayim to fulfill his role as a redeemer, he failed to actually perform Brit Milah to circumcise his son Gershom. And by failing to perform the mitzvah of Brit Milah, the Torah says that Hashem was actually ready to strike and kill Moshe. We read here in Shemot Exodus 4, 19-20, and later verse 24-26, Vayom Adonai O Moshe, Midian Lech Shuv. Now go, return to uh, from Midian, who's in Moshe. Now Lech Shuv Mitzrayim. You need to leave and you need to return to Mitzrayim. For all the people who sought to seek your life, they have been, they have died. They're mate. Okay, they cease to exist. Vachach Moshe et Ishto ve'et Banav. Moshe took his wife. He took his sons. He mounted them on the donkey and and he returned to the land of Mitzrayim. Now this is important. I'll explain this highlighted passage in a minute. Moshe then took the staff of God in his hand. And the Torah goes on to say afterwards that it was a derech Bamalon, that he was on the way in the lodging, okay, resting. And therefore, Vayiv Kesheichu Adonai, Vayiv Akesh Hamito, Hashem encountered him and sought to kill him. And so, Sipora, his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and touched it to his feet. And she then said afterwards, Ki chatanda min atali, you have caused my bridegroom bloodshed. So she released him and she said afterwards, a bridegroom's bloodshed was because of la mulot, because of the circumcision. Now before Hashem commanded Moshe to return to Mitzrayim to confront Paro regarding the redemption of the Jewish people, Moshe, according to the Torah, was nothing more than an average Jew. However, I want you to notice, going back to what I highlight in yellow, the moment Moshe vayechach et mateha elokim biyado, Moshe put the staff of God in his hand, meaning he accepted the role of being a redeemer, a goel, a leader, etc. He was no longer considered an average Jew. And that means any failure to comply with the mitzvah to the Torah would be met with immediate punishment. We also learn later in Sefer Shmuel Beit or 2 Samuel that when Uzab ben Aminadav attempted to prevent the Ark of the Covenant from falling over, he was killed. We go here to 2 Samuel 6, 6 through 7. And it says afterwards, ad aron. And it came to the threshing floor in Achon. And Uzzah, he reached down and touched the Archa Elohim of God. And he grasped it. Why? Because the oxen had dislodged it. And Hashem, it says, became angry at Uzzah. And therefore struck him there for this great mistake. And Uzzah died there by the Ark of God. In a lot of these passages, people become very, very confused about the nature of the Creator because for one, He's perceived or taught or preached as being somebody who's loving. 
merciful, compassionate. El Rachum Vechanun, as the Torah says, right? However, and we see in these instances with well, Aharon's two sons, we see with Moshe Rabbeinu, and then we see later on here in Sefer Shmuel, there is no grace period. It's automatic, immediate punishment, and people experience the death sentence. That's what happens. And so this has led scholars to speculate upon the different personalities of the God of the Jewish people, the God of the Hebrews, the God of the Israelites in their studies when learning about ancient Israelite history. They perceive that obviously this is some type of emergence of one belief deity that maybe the northern kingdom believed in, the, another belief of another deity, the different titles that the Semitic people would have used, such as Baal and things of that nature, and this was a convergence of this personality Therefore, we find this split personality, this bipolar behavior of the Creator where he's loving in one case and then he's schizophrenic and sadistic in another case. And this is also what led the Church Father Marcion to teach that the God of the so-called Old Testament uh, was someone completely evil and different than the God of the New Testament, which was loving and merciful. And tragically, this comes from individuals who are outside of the Jewish framework even though you could do the historical studies, but without properly understanding this in context, you will arrive at a distorted understanding of these passages. But we do see here, clearly, okay, there is no grace period in many of these examples. And so from these passages, we learn that there is a difference between how God relates to the misbehavior of a person chosen for a divine purpose compared to an ordinary person. The actions of the spiritually mature are subject to scrutiny while the actions of the spiritually immature, they are given grace to rectify their ways. Now, among Chazal, there is, or I should say, are different interpretations as to why Nadav and Abihu died. And according to the Gemara, over a Masechet Urvin, Nadav and Abihu, they were held chayev or liable for trying to issue a Pesach or a Halachic ruling against Moshe Naharon while they were still alive. We read here in Urvin 63a, Rabbi Eliezer, he says that the sons of Aharon died only because they issued a halachic ruling before Moshe, the teacher. And obviously this was asked in the form of a question from Rabbi Eliezer. Well, okay, if that's the case, then uh, the Rush, what, was they, what were they expounding on? And it says that in support of their conclusion, they must, they must bring fire instead of opposed for, to waiting for fire to come down from the heavens. It's stated there in the Torah in Leviticus 1.7. And it says, And uh, the sons of Aharon, and this is referring to the lighting of the Mizbeach, the altar, etc., when you go back to Parsha of Vayichra, that venatenu b'nei Aharon ha-kohen esh al ha-Mizbeach. The sons of Aaron, the Kohenim, they shall put fire on the altar and they shall lay wood on it. And this is referring to the Corbin oat, right? So if it's their job to do it, and they were essentially following the functions of lighting the fire, why did God kill them? So that led them to say, meaning not Avanavi, who, although fire descends from heaven, because that's what initially started the fire on the Mizbeach, specifically the middle prior, which was a supernatural fire, that's another topic for another day, okay? Chazal says it's nonetheless a mitzvah now, according to the reasoning of Nadav and Avihu, to bring ordinary fire. Although they derive from this verse, they were punished for ruling in the presence of their teacher. And there is a very deep subject to go into on this, in, in that Nadav and Avihu had some very, very, um, they had some very, very revolutionary chidushim, insight ideas, that they wanted to usher in the Torah of Olam Haba, the Torah of the world to come. They were at a higher Darga Madriga level, technically, than Moshe and Aharon. However, there's a protocol, there's a rule of law to follow, and even in their greatest ambitions and enthusiasm to bring this greatness, even this chidush that the Gemara renders here with the fire, essentially, why wait on the fire of heaven? Let us start the fire, let us initiate and bring that fire, it starts with us. Very, very interesting concept because enthusiasm in Jewish, Jewish thought is akin to fire, okay? It's a part of a deeper concept in which uh, the machazita shechel was to be used 
when you go to Parashat, uh, back to Parashat Truma, etc., and we Parashat Kitasa, okay, with the Machzit, the half shekel was given, and the Chazal say Moshe can understand how that can be used as a form of kapara, atonement, and they say Moshe was shown a vision of a matbiyasha ish, this coin of fire. Like, I mean, money, what is money in a nebulous, uh, intangible world or reality, such as a spiritual realm, right? It's nothing. Um, and therefore, the concept behind that, the principle is that fire is akin to enthusiasm. So when one gives the concept of sadaka, right? They give, and it's from a nadiv lev, like a willing heart, like the ninadav originates from that root there. Willingness. This is a fire of enthusiasm that really draws one close to Hashem. And so in that sense, Nadav and Nabi, who had that aspiration, however, they jumped too far ahead of themselves. Now, according to the Midrash, Nadav and Nabi, who were actually liable for death because they asked Moshe, they asked a rhetorical question amongst themselves, wondering when Moshe Naharon would die so they could assume leadership of the Jewish people. And we read here on Vayich Rabba 2010. And this is a reference to Exodus 24, Parsha Mishpatim, at the end of the revelation of Hashem Har Sinai. And it says, Men and it says, when Moshe Naharon walked, it says, not Avi who walked behind him. And also it mentioned the elders and all of Israel fall behind him, because this is talking about the group that sent to Har Sinai, Moshe, the Konim, and then the actual Sanhedrin. And it says, not of an Abihu, they would say, when will these two elders, Zekenim, die, Metim? When will they pass away? And therefore, Va'anu, we can actually, Nohagin, Sarara El Hasibor, we can assume authority over the community of Israel. We will be in charge. Now, I realize this is something arrogant to say, especially behind the backs of your leaders. Never bite the hand that feeds you. The disciple is never greater than the teacher, as all the old adages say. But once again, this is a reflection of what we just read in the Gemara. This enthusiastic desire to take over after experiencing this great revelation of God on Har Sinai, to be able to bring these great deeper spiritual experiences amongst the people. Right? This is really what the, the Midrash is capturing, similar to the Gemara. But it does appear to be selfish and disrespectful okay, to one's elders. That's the second reason why Nadav and Abihu were liable for death. A third reason that they were liable is that they never had children. In fact, when we go to Parshat Bamidbar, we find here this account in Numbers 3, 4, it says, Vayamad Nadav Avihu lefnei Adonai, Nadav and Avihu died before Hashem, Behach riva esh zara lefnei Adonai, when they offered a strange fire before Hashem, but Midbar Sinai in the wilderness, a Sinai, and it says, Uvani lo hayu lahem, and they had no children. Okay, they had no children. It is a mitzvah for the, uh, for the Kohenim, to have children, to be married, etc. And the Midrash comments upon this, and it says, Rav Yaakov, the son of Baravi, speaking in the name of Rav Acha, says, if these sons of Ahabon had had sons, they would have preceded Eleazar and Itamar in greatness. It is a rule that anyone who has offspring takes precedence compared to those who do not have the hairs. And considering that Nadav and Nabi, who were older than Eleazar and Itamar, this is the point that the Midrash is bringing up. It says their shortcoming was that they did not marry, and assure themselves any offspring. So we find here something that also runs as an antithesis to Jewish thought, okay? Judaism does not promote the concept of celibacy, like when you see in the Christian religion and various denominations of Christianity when there's celibacy practiced by monks which attempt to obtain an angelic state. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not certain aesthetic practices in mystical Jewish thought. There is. However, it comes with a warning, okay, that men are not to be separate from their wives for a certain period of time because they have an actual legal obligation to provide bia, conjugal relations, to their spouses. And yes, peru or vu, create, provide parnosa, income, livelihood, things of that nature, 
protection that's all within the ketubah contract between a husband and a wife as well in biblical times to a plagish, which was a concubine who was entitled to the same things but did not actually have rights to a ketubah as they were not the main wife of the man. So we see here that this view is not something that's actually praised in Jewish thought. Okay, Hashem did not create us as angels and um, what we see in the Christian realm and other religions in which one takes on an oath or some type of celibacy uh, to live like a monk or a recluse, they remove themselves from the temptation of society. The Torah is the opposite of that. The Torah teaches us that God throws us in the midst of the chaos of society, in the temptations of society, and it is there where we learn to master a Yetzirah, not to kill it, but to master it, to make it subservient. Obviously, one doesn't throw themselves in immediate danger if they're not prepared to. So there is proper preparation, okay, to go into this situation, right? But what we see here at the end of the day is that Nadav and Avi, who obviously aspired to live a very high and holy lifestyle, and angelic in nature of some sort, and yet this was not pleasing to Hashem according to these interpretations. The last reason, the fourth reason, Nadav and Avi, who were liable of death, is because they were not authorized by Hashem to offer the incense. And that's what we read in this week's Torah portion, Leviticus 10, 1 through 2. It says there, Nadavanavihu took a fire pan. They put fire in them, they placed incense on it, and they brought a foreign fire, a strange fire before Hashem that he, Asher Lo Siva Otam, did not command him. They were not authorized to do what they did. And as a consequence, the Torah says that a fire went out from Hashem, consuming them and killing them. Now, while the, each of these four interpretations I just presented about the death or the reason behind the death of Nadav and Navi, who appeared to be unrelated, the fact is they're actually all related. How? Well, each interpretation is a unique perspective that deals with the spiritual flaws of Nadav and Avihu. Okay, and this also explains, and I think I deal with this in a separate teaching that should be uploaded to this week's Torah portion called The Vindication of the Pig. Very interesting because we see that immediately after this tragic episode, the Torah changes gears and starts to talk about Kashrut, talks about the subject matter of kosher, right? And mind you, the Torah doesn't even barely scratch the surface. The written Torah, Torah Shabbat Tav, doesn't scratch the surface of all the laws of Kashrut. Okay, it focuses on what you can eat, what you cannot eat. Okay, and even when it focuses on the animals, we see that it only delineates the four specific categories of animals, right? You have the chazer, the piggy, because it looks kosher on the outside, but it doesn't mali gera, it doesn't chew its could, so it's deceitful. Uh, you have the arnevet, the hare, and you have the gamol, the camel. Okay, you have the different animals that each have a kosher quality and a non-kosher quality. And then eventually the Torah goes into next week's Torah portion, actually the Torah portion of Tazriya Metzora, and explains the skin disease, a sara'at, that has mistakenly been called leprosy, and a person afflicted with the sara'at is called a metzora or a metzorat if they're female, and that's from a contraction of motzi ra, one who brings out evil, and as a consequence they are exiled outside the camp of Israel, and the only person who, who can actually um, declare their healing is the Kohen. And this has to be done through Shuvah because Sara'at is actually a spiritual affliction, disease that manifests physically on one's body, one's possessions, and one's money. Okay? And it severs them from the community, and then eventually they have to do this strange ritual purification, okay, through the slaughtering of two birds, bring them back in, and then eventually we get the Ahrimot that talks about the atonement process, which seems to be related to the misbehavior in Adav and Avihu. So, really, these interpretations that Chazal propose, they're, they're basically explaining okay, the flaws of Nadav and Navihu. And so when you examine the Kashrut laws and the, the Metzorah, you're actually learning about the spiritual defects that Nadav and Navihu had within them. Okay? And how each individual that falls into the category of those things, like eating Chazer flesh, that represents a hypocrite. One sticks his hooves out and says, look, 
Ani kosheram, I'm a kosher behema. But really, does not mali geira, does not true they could, right? So this person's a hypocrite. And so we learn on a very deep level that this is an inner uh, dynamic of the Torah to explode, to expose a spiritual flaw. And so I do believe that teaching is up on our YouTube channel uh, called Vindication of the Pigs. Take a look at it when you get the chance. So instead of actually explaining in this teaching how the four interpretations I just mentioned are all connected, I would like for us to focus on the Torah statement where it says that the reason that Navdav and Navihu, the reason why Navdav and Navihu was killed by God is because they brought an unauthorized offering, which I'll go back here once again to Leviticus 10, 1 through 2. Okay, Torah says here at the end, Asher lo siva otam. God did not command them, did not authorize them to bring the incense. Now, while the incense that Nadav and Avihu burned was identical to that which their father Aharon had offered, there was a major difference. Aharon was obeying the will of God, while Nadav and Avihu performed an action that Hashem did not command. So what the Torah is trying to teach us here is a valuable lesson in how we approach Hashem and our relationship, our worship of Him. The transgression of Nandav and Avi, who illustrates a dichotomy in one's approach and to one's observance of the Torah. In other words, their spiritual connection to God versus the ceremonial ritual performance that is perceived externally by the world. A mitzvah is not only a perfunctionary action, it must also translate into an experience, into a feeling. The Torah demands that we experience joy when we perform a mitzvah. For example, later on in the Chumash Devarim and Parashat Kitavo, the Torah mentions the reason why we experience the curses of the Torah is due to a lack of smicha, a lack of joy. Deuteronomy 28, 44, 45, excuse me, through 47. All of these curses, chasas chalila, will come upon you, not just upon you, or dafucha, but will also pursue you and dominate you, overtake you until chasachalila you are destroyed. Why is that? Because you do not hearken, listen to the voice of Hashem your God to do what? Lishmur mitzvotav vechukotav asher sivach to basically observe His commandments and decrees that He commanded you. It will be a sign of wonder in you and in your offspring forever. Why is that? Well, because you did not serve Hashem your God in joy, in the goodness of your heart when everything was abundant. Simply put, you lack joy. This is the consequence. And we could go into a whole spiel on this about why people want to experience sickness, want to experience depression. One is a result of a lack of joy, a lack of gratitude, and that eventually breaks the biology of a person, it affects their mental state. There's so many things you can get into. So naturally, one who goes into those dark periods of depression or low self-esteem and attempt to serve God ritualistically, okay, even if they observe Shabbat or eat kosher, observe Taharat mishpacha but they do it outside of joy, that's not really experiencing the Torah. It's just a ceremonial approach. And so naturally, they're not going to experience any healing or goodness because they're doing it from a dark state. Over Masech Shabbat, Chazal taught that the Shekhinah only dwells on a person who is filled with joy, especially performing the mitzvah with joy. We read here in Shabbat 30b. It says here, She'en Shekhinah shora lo mitoch. Atzevut, the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, does not rest on an individual who is in a state of atzevut, of sadness, or mitoch atzelut, in a state of laziness, or lethargic, okay? And it's not just lethargic to things physically, like they don't exercise enough, but it could also be the spiritual things, all right? Velo mitoch sechok, they're in a state of frivolity, everything's a joke to them, they don't take anything serious. Velo mitoch kalut rosh, or also, they're in a state of idle conversation, as they say in Yiddish, they're uh, yenta, okay? 
yeah, 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 idle, idle. They're never really taking their words on no substance. They're in the gossip. They're concerned about what's happening in the pol political world, etc. Okay? Or also, if they're in the state of idle chatter, rather, Chazal says, Eli metoch devar simcha shel mitzvah. Rather, Shechina only rests upon an individual who is in joy of the mitzvot. Okay? Enjoy. And don't sit there and think that you got to crack a, a smile on your face when you know, you're performing, uh, like you're putting tefillin on or something, right? Uh, no, it's, it's the concept that even when your world is being disrupted and challenged, uh, you're performing the mitzvah of joy when you're with your wife, when you're with your children, even you don't feel like it because you're going through circumstances that are trying to deter you from keeping that state of contentment. This is the the type of the mitzvah Chazal is talking about, the Shekinah dwelling upon a person. Now, when you think about fasting, right, like on Yom Kippur, why do we fast? Because the Bible says so, the Torah says so. Well, yes, but what's the attitude? The result of such obedience to the Torah, okay, it must be ecstatic. It must be an illuminating experience to transform our personality. Not just simply doing it because that's what it says according to the letter of the law. So if you were to ask a question to many people, does God desire mitzvot to your heart? What do you think the answer would be? The Ramchal explained that Hashem actually does, is not satisfied with performance of mitzvot alone by themselves. Rather, it's the state of one's mind, the state of their heart in performing the mitzvah that Hashem wants. And we read here in Mesilat Yesharim. It says over here, Ki Adom Levadam, that the master, blessed be he, is not satisfied with deeds alone. Okay, in the performance of a mitzvah, i.e. the letter of the law. Rather, the most important thing to him is that the heart... Okay, the heart should be tahor, it should be pure, and it should be la avoda ha'amitit. It should be done in true worship, true, pure worship. Very, very interesting definition from the Ram Chol, which is interesting because at this time of the year, when we're doing Sferat Omer, we work on Musar, character rectification. And Mesulat Yesharim is one of the books that I personally study. In fact, I have some of the teachings of it on the YouTube channel. I recommend you to do so. If you're not big on Ram Chal, then pick up Perkei Avot. Pick up Chavot uh, Levaot, Duties of the Heart, for Rabbi Bachia Ibn Pakuda. Some type of more Musar you work on. So performing mitzvot like thoughtless machines is not enough to bring honor to God. When we perform a mitzvah, we must bring our heart. Our heart must be focused on Hashem alone. And there are two ways to approach Hashem. There's the Torah way, and there's the pagan way, if I can use that term that way. The Torah way requires us to fashion our lives according to God's discipline, as illustrated by the Hebrew word vetsivanu, as we say in the blessing, you have commanded us. The reason that we perform a mitzvah is to surrender to God's will. However, we must progress from that surrender to a unique experience that encompasses our entire being. What do I mean? Let's take prayer for an example. Prayer begins as an obligatory act with rigid requirements of time, location, and behavior. Meaning that as we now progress into the summertime, okay, spring now, we just passed the spring equinox, moving into summer when the sun is out longer, even though I don't like the time change, which is you know, artificial by man. Uh, essentially, we know that the sun comes up earlier in the morning. Okay, which means shahrit begins earlier compared to the winter when it's later. So that means that for a person to do their due diligence of davening, especially if it's with a minion, they need to get their tukas out of bed earlier, okay, in the morning. And also the location of where they have to go is also very important. And it's the behavior, how they get up out of bed to go and encounter Hashem in the experience of prayer. Not just to go fly through the sudur, Okay, at a million miles per hour, and then off they go to business. No, they have to experience Hashem in a unique way. And so what we see here is that it's all about how a person prepares himself. And so while we fight with our Yitzhahara, okay, to fulfill our obligation in something like prayer, we need to keep in mind that our approach to prayer should never be mechanical. 
as we progress in our relationship with Hashem, prayer is the medium that allows us to experience that intimate connection. And so when we approach prayer, we need to develop the proper kavanah or attention that we are currently encountering the Rabboni Sholam, the master of the universe. We are standing before him, though we cannot physically see him, the presence of the creator is there. We can imagine as we close our eyes, he's standing, the presence is there, whatever that may be, okay? Not to get into some type of idolatrous description since God is not corporal, but the idea is that he is there. We are here, we are standing before him. And as we have that, that feeling reverberates within us. It uplifts us, it should transform us. Let me explain this through a story I once heard. There was once a student who approached his rabbi about prayer. And he went to his rabbi and he says, Hey, Rebbe, how is it possible for someone like yourself, and he is up in age, to pray the same words every single day and not become bored? Right? Because to this student, it's like he was lip servicing as they opened the Siddur and they started, well, Baruch Shemar, Baruch Shemar, everything was all just lip service. That's all it was. So the rabbi then looked at his disciple and he said, although the prayer is the same every day, you are not the same person as you were yesterday. So it is not boring. The rabbi then paused and said while pointing at the student, and if you are the same person that you were yesterday, then it's not the prayer that is boring, but it's you that is boring. This concept applies with all mitzvot. Currently right now, we're in the middle of Pesach, and we eat matzah for a week, right? Now, anyone who says that matzah is the greatest tasting thing in the world are genuine liars. God bless you, right? Okay? 90% of the Jewish population admits that matzah is not the greatest. The other 10% are liars. That's just how it is, okay? Now, of course, I know there are also thousands of Jews at this time who are starving to death because of kitniyot. So those would be Ashkenazim, our prayers are with you. But no offense to anyone based upon their nusach. But the idea here is that we're commanded to eat matzah, right? Why? Because it's a mitzvah? That's what we're told to do at this time of the year? No, we need to understand that eating matzah is an act of love for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that spiritually, there's something happening in the invisible worlds when we engage in that mitzvah of eating matzah during the seven days of matzot. And therefore, when we say a blessing, we eat it, we chew on it, we nourish, we think about it, there's something happening, spiritual energy taking place. But if we just, you know, schlep through the motions, it's a thing we do, we're not really making a connection here. Also take, for example, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur begins with total surrender to the will of Hashem. Fasting for 26 hours may seem uncomfortable to many people. No food, no water, etc. But if we fast out of love for Hashem, then we're not simply fasting from food. That's not what we're doing. We're taking upon ourselves an obligation that requires the absence of food and water. It's not simply being away from that. And therefore, when a person operates at that level, they're not going to have hunger pains or thirst issues, etc. And so when connecting to Hashem, the road consists of two steps. One is obedience to God's mitzvot, and two is experiencing HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the mitzvot. The pagan way of approaching God is based on being ceremonially religious. It begins with excitement, but later culminates in disillusionment. The pagan way to approach God is like the secular world where people use drugs and alcohol to create an artificial feeling of happiness. They get, as we know, a 15-minute high, and then it comes down, and the reality crashes. In fact, even in the Torah, we see this concept with the life of Korach. Korach erred by confusing the ceremonial with God's mitzvot. And Chazal explained the reason why Parashat Korach is juxtaposed in the mitzvah a seat seat, which is at the end of Parsha Chukach, is because Korach attempted to discredit Moshe by questioning the mitzvah seat seat. In fact, according to the Midrash, Korach wanted to know that, hey, if a person wears a garment made completely a techelet, the sky blue that's supposed to be on the, on the seat seat, 
are they still required to wear the seat seat with one strand of techelet, patil techelet? Right? The whole garment is made techelet. And Moshe told Chorach that even if the whole garment is made techelet, you're still required, according to Halakha, to wear the seat seat with techelet. Afterwards, Korach then asks Moshe, let's say a person has a home of nothing but Sifrei Torah, right? From wall to wall in their home. Are they required to put a mezuzah on each of their doorposts or gateways as prescribed by the Torah? Right? Because they have the entire Word of God inside their home. Moshe told Korach that even if a person has all the Sifrei Torah in the world in their home, they're still required, according to Halakha, to affix a mezuzah on all their doorposts and gateways in their home. And so the Midrash mentions that upon hearing this ruling from Moshe, Korach mocked him and decided to stage a coup against him Aharon. And therefore we have the first political move in the Jewish history, Miflega Korach, right there in Parsha Korach. And sadly we know what happened. We know that Korach's attempt to outroot Moshe bitterly failed, resulting in his death. Korach's era was that he focused on the ceremonial aspect of the mitzvot while ignoring the need to experience God in the mitzvot. And when we look at the tragic episode of the Chei Ego, we learn that the Jewish people created something that Hashem did not command them to create. See, unlike the Mishkan that Hashem commanded the people to make, He did not command them to make a golden calf. Now, one of the things that we find over and over through the Torah is a unique expression, Kasher Siva Adonai Et Moshe, Kasher Siva Adonai Et Moshe, translation, as Hashem commanded Moshe. This appears in relation to the Mishkan. It testifies the Mishkan was something God wanted the Jewish people to experience, even back in Exodus 25a, V'yasuli mikdash v'shachante betocham, and they shall produce for me a dwelling place that I may dwell betocham in them. The construction of the Golden calf was flat out an act of Avodah Zarah. It was foreign worship because Hashem did not order its construction. Also, in the Tanakh, we read that David HaMelech wanted to express his gratitude to Hashem by building the Beha Mikdash. However, Hashem did not permit David to build the Beha Mikdash. Hashem wanted Shlomo to build the, the actual Beha Mikdash. That's what his desire, that's what his command was. And so when we look at the tragedy of Nadav and Avihu, we come to learn that when the Torah says, And they drew near to Hashem, with this foreign alien of fire, that Hashem did not command it. They attempted to draw close to Hashem, okay, with something that was not authorized by Him, that was not a part of His will. They had the ceremonial down packed. It looked good on the outside, but something was missing on the inside. And tragically, the result of their actions caused their early demise. The divine command of the Torah and our discipline in obeying that command are how we experience Hashem. Any deviation, especially by the spiritually mature, Siddiquim, etc., is unacceptable and ultimately doomed to failure. Over in Shmuel Beit, 2 Samuel, many of us know the story. Shaul HaMelech was advised by Shmua Hanavi that once he conquers Agag, the king of the Amalekites, he was to kill him, kill all the Amalekites, and all of their livestock. But what happened? Shaul, instead of doing what God commanded him to do, decided to preserve the life of Agag, who, according to Jewish history, was able to get his wife pregnant at the time, which later brought wicked hum into existence, and to preserve the livestock, because, you know, we can use the livestock for Corbin Oath. We can sacrifice it to God. We'll use their animals as a mockery to them to sacrifice to a God. And so when Shmuel confronted Shaul, what did he tell him? He said to him a statement that is well known that people use when they communicate or rebuke each other about walking in God's ways. Shemua mezevachtov. Obedience is better than sacrifice, as it says in 2 Samuel 15, 22. And so what we learn from this is that Hashem is not interested in our religious understanding of Him. Okay? He's not interested in our philosophical outlook of Him. Hashem wants us to experience Him through His Torah. And so when we learn to develop an affinity for Hashem through the mitzvot, that is when we experience Hashem in the recesses of our soul. 
This is why later in Parshat Achremot, excuse me, Hashem warned Moshe to tell Aharon that when he approaches the divine presence, he doesn't do it in any manner that he thinks is okay, but only in the manner that is brought down in the Torah, as we see in Leviticus 16, verse 2. Hashem said to Moshe, speak to your brother Aaron. He shall not come in at all times. Translation, in any way he feels. He feels. God is not a woke God. Okay, He doesn't operate on your feelings. Into the sanctuary within the parochet, the curtain, which is in front of the cover. Okay, Asher El Aharon, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, Velo Yamutki Benan Erae El Hakaporet, in order that he should die. For in a cloud I will appear upon the Ark cover. And so, in conclusion to our teaching for Parsha Shmini, what this teaches us, friends, is that if we are not having good results in our connection with Hashem and His Torah, Maybe it's time for us to analyze at this time of Sefirat Omer coming on the, off the heels of Pesach, how we approach God and His Torah. Are we doing it properly or are we doing it based on feelings? Well, I prayed, I've been faithful in this, I'm still not seeing results. I hate to say this, but God does not care about our feelings, okay? He does not care about our feelings. We are to be subservient to the master of the universe, which means that when we do things according to to His divine will, we will see results. That is a guarantee, 110% from our And so with that said, I hope that this teaching challenges you, inspires you, maybe even dis disturbs you, upsets you, okay? But it pushes you in the right direction in order to see proper growth. And I hope it disturbs the religious folks out there. Once again, don't play with fire. Dead religion is dead, it doesn't do anything. It may be great beauty in the ceremonial approach, but if there's no, no soul with inside, it means nothing. Okay? It means nothing whatsoever. And so with that said, that's going to bring us to a close for the teaching of Parsha Shemini. Once again, I have another teaching online regarding the vindication of the pig. And as I explained at the beginning of this teaching, with God's help, I, will, I am planning to upload another teaching in relation to Pesach that I didn't get a chance to upload before Pesach began. But... We got self, I'll try to have it uploaded before the end of Pesach, and hopefully everyone will be able to get some insight from that teaching as well regarding the historical events that unfolded in those days. Because, as I explained in my Haggadah teaching, the events that unfolded then are parallel to the events that will unfold in the future redemption as well. And so if our organization has been a blessing to you and you're blessed by it and you would like to donate, you can find the links to donate directly below the video's description. It'll take you right to our website. We greatly thank you for your support. And if you have any questions pertaining to this teaching, you can send me an email. I'll get to those in the order that they arrive in. Until next time, Chavarim, may the God of Avraham, Yitzach, and Yaakov bless you and your family. Shalom and Kol